put aside everything this month just to tell again the story of the, the nativity, the birth of Jesus, and then this year, according to Matthew. Now let me read this whole chapter to you. Chapter 2. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we see his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And he said unto them, unto him, they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they had presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Rise and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of by the Lord the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Now Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and on all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. But when Herod was dead, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, one of the things I love about the Lord's holidays is that they're always real. It's not fantasy land. It's rooted in reality. Like you'd never make up a Christmas holiday with a King Herod in it that slaughters babies and things like that. But th th look, this is, this is not made up. This is history. This has actually happened. Jesus actually was born into this world. He came from heaven. He beca God became a man. God became a baby. I mean, men for centuries look up into the face of God. But for the first time, Mary in, in, in the stable looks down into the face of God. And what it, why did God have to come from heaven to do that? Because that's what it took to save us from our sins. And you got characters like the wise men or the shepherds or King Herod. And one of the things about this story, because it is real and it's true and it's also spiritual, is that everyone here is in this story somewhere, okay? 
Some, some people are like the inn. There's no room for Christ in, the, in their life. Okay. Some people are like the shepherds. Uh, the outcasts, but they could see something no one else could see. Some people are like the wise men. They go to a lot of trouble because they know something. And they seek it out. The wise men seek him. And wise men still seek him, right? And some people are like Herod. They want to stomp it out. They want to take it out completely. Let's talk about Herod because we talked about everything else so far about this story over the last few weeks. But he says, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Who is Herod? Let, let's just put it this way. About a hundred years before Jesus Christ was born, the land of Judea had a king named Hyrcanus. Hyrcanus made war. The Jews made war on their ancient enemy, the Edomites. The Edomites are an everlasting, ancient, inveterate enemy of Jews to this day. You have the Palestinians and all that stuff. That's a fake name. These are basically Edomites. The Arab world that's Muslim now hates the Jews, wants to wipe them out. This is something called the everlasting hatred. Now, when Hyrcanus made war on Edom, he did something that they never, you never see done in Jewish history. He forcibly converted the population. Now, a forced convert can't be a convert. You gotta, you gotta be born again of your heart. We can't force anyone and wouldn't. I sometimes wish I could just take the lid off people's heads and pour it in, but you can't do that. It's a choice. You gotta make your choice. You gotta open up your life to God or not, right? But they forced converted a whole nation that was a bitter enemy of them. And uh, one of the top families in that nation was the Herods. And what they did is they went along with it. And the Herods actually scrupulously, uh, scrupulously observed a form of Judaism. Like they wouldn't eat pork and they wouldn't, uh, you know, they kept feast days and kept kosher and all this stuff. Now, uh, <laughs> they also were very, very connected politically. In fact, there was a invasion of the Holy Land by what we call Iran now, it's called the Parthians then. And the Herods fled to Rome and there, this Herod that you're reading about here became a friend of Caesar. And he became a friend of the next Caesar, Tiberius, who became known as Augustus. That's the Caesar that was when, in power when Jesus was born. And through his connections, uh, he, he actually was appointed as king of the Jews by the Roman Senate. <laughs> okay. Now, now, you know why this is important? Because king of the Jews, David... The king, back centuries earlier, God told him, your sons will be kings of the Jews, and one of your sons is going to be the king that shall reign forever and ever, the Messiah. Now just think about how low things had sunk when you got an Edomite appointed by a secular senate as king of the Jews and backed by Roman power. But he was appointed king of the Jews. That's how Herod got to power. Declared king of the Jews, not by God, but by the Roman Senate. And by a, uh, a man, by the way, the Caesar of Rome, called himself divine. Called himself the divine Augustus. And his messages were called gospels. And he, he was the first man in Rome that was considered a god even while he was still alive. See, what, what, what I'm pointing out is that like the first coming of Jesus is going to be very similar to the second coming of Jesus because the conditions on this earth have sunk so low that you have what's called the spirit of Antichrist, some replacement for the real Christ. 
Herod is a replacement of the real king of the Jews that was coming. In fact, that's part of what this story is. You've got the real king of the Jews, and you've got the fake king of the Jews, and the real king of the Jews is just a baby, and the fake king of the Jews is a fully grown, ruthless, brutal man, as you can see by this, uh, by this story here. This is the part of the Christmas story you never see a Christmas card about. He kills all the babies in Bethlehem. Uh, it's powerful. It's raw. It's true to reality. Now, this Herod was so out of control in his own personal life, he's paranoid all the time because he's an imposter. He's in a, he's in a place he doesn't belong. He's supposedly the Messiah. <laughs> no. He's so paranoid he killed his own son. This made the Caesar at the time, this is all secular history, it's not in the Bible. The Caesar made a quip that was a joke. He said, Her it's safer to be Herod's pig than his son. Because Herod was scrupulous about keeping kosher. <laughs> but he didn't think, of th think about killing his own son. He's, a very, he's called Herod the Great, though, because he's one of the great builders of the ancient world. He, he remodeled the temple. Took him 46 years. Did a great job, too, by the way. The temple Jesus taught in was remodeled by Herod. He was the president of the Olympic Games one year, and he bankrolled it. When he knew he was going to die, he wanted to be mourned, and he knew people didn't like him. So he ordered his generals and lieutenants to massacre 10,000 Jews, hopefully the most prominent ones. So they'd be crying in the streets when he had his funeral. <laughs> I don't think he's the Messiah, do you? <laughs> Actually, he's anti-Messiah. And so that's who Herod was. That's who we're talking about here. Someone like that. So the wise men come and tell him, uh, we've come to worship the king of the Jews. Doing up go his antennas. Okay, and he says, well, when you find him, tell me, because I want to come and worship him too. Now, isn't that just like the world leaders today? They all pretend to piety, you know, worshiping God. Uh, even, even the Clintons claim to have faith, okay, whatever that is. Nancy Pelosi talks about her Catholicism just doesn't let her hate people. And then she goes to promote abortion and homosexuality. It was the same kind of thing back then and it is today. The second coming of Jesus is just like the first coming of Jesus. Even down to the census, because there is coming a census. A mark of the beast is going to be imposed on the world. The final religious test is coming. And that it'll be through, for the same reason, for the Caesars to control. Okay. Look, the second coming is just a replay of the first coming. And so everything that you see there. So anyway, uh, Herod, when he finds out, it took about two years for the wise men to find Jesus. The wise men did not show up in the stable. The wise men showed up in a home in Nazareth. And when they finally found the place, and the reason we know that is because the word for baby is child. They came and found the young child. That's a specific Greek word for someone like two years old and toddler age. Okay. The wise men found the very house in Nazareth, got off their camels, and worshipped Jesus. This is one of the Christmas message. Worship Jesus. I don't care who you are, how important you think you are, whatever. If you won't get down off your high horse and worship Jesus Christ, then you, you're not as wise as you think you are. Uh, the wisdom says, man, I see something in this person. Okay. And uh, they, they got down to worship Jesus, and then they were warned by God, don't tell Herod. Okay. So when Herod realized that the wise men weren't going to come back and tell him, then he sent his lieutenants to Bethlehem and he said, look, let's not take any chances. Every baby boy from birth to two years old, kill him. Just kill him. This literally happened. And the soldiers went in and killed every single one of them. Okay. 
See, the, the, the wonder of the world kind of gravitates toward a, like a syrupy, sentimentally type Christmas spirit, you know, jingle bells and all that stuff. Because the real story is raw and true to humanity and true to life and makes real demands on us, okay? They went and killed every child in Bethlehem. And Matthew says they're fulfilling a, prophet, a prophecy because Jeremiah gave a prophecy about Rachel who symbolizes the mother of Israel, Jacob's favorite wife, weeping for her children, and she would not be comforted. And Matthew says that's the prophecy that was fulfilled in Ramah, uh, a voice of weeping, he says. Rachel weeping for her children, but she would not be comforted. Well, now, originally when Jeremiah gave that prophecy, he was talking about uh, Rama, which is right next to Bethlehem, is a place where when the, when the Babylonian captivity happened, they rounded up all the Jews at Rama. it was the staging ground, where they tied them together and took them into captivity for 70 years. They frog-marched them 400 miles to the other side of the Euphrates. So that's what Jeremiah is talking about. But Matthew says, no, he was talking about that, but he was talking about something even else. And this, this underscores what prophecy is really all about, is repetitive patterns. Okay, you got, this is a fulfillment of it, that's a fulfillment of it, that's a fulfillment of it, that's a fulfillment of it, until the final fulfillment. And he says, this fulfills what Jeremiah said in Ramah, Rachel, weeping for her children, but she will not be comforted. How many centuries of Jews being rounded up? How many centuries of Jews being killed? How many centuries of Jews being unjustly treated? How many centuries of Holocaust? You think about the Holocaust, that's not, that's not the first time that happened. That's the icing on 2,000 years of that. It's just the technology was much more effect, effective. Rachel weeping for her children. He says, that's, that's, Herod fulfilled that prophecy. Now, I doubt Herod knew that he was fulfilling a prophecy, but he was. In fact, he was fulfilling a lot more than he thought. See, this is, this is the crux of my message today. You take that Rachel weeping for her children. Another thing about Rama is that Rachel, the real biblical Rachel, was flee had to they had to the family had to flee where they were living because two of her sons committed genocide on a town they tricked him into getting circumcised and then killed every one of them and she was the problem was she was very pregnant she only had two children Joseph and then this one she was pregnant with well they had to flee they had to run for their lives but when they got to Rama right outside of Bethlehem, Rachel went into labor prematurely. And she had a very, very tough birth. It was back and forth, up and down. And finally, she bore a child, a boy, and she named him Ben-Ami, son of my sorrow, son of my pain. But then right after that, she died. She was Jacob's favorite wife. So he renamed the child Benjamin. 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 Son of my right hand. Now in a sense, that's a prophecy. The son of sorrows is the son of the right hand of God. The man of sorrows, the man of suffering, the babe so poor he's born in a stable, will one day be exalted to the right hand of God the Father in majesty, and he will be glorified by all. Every knee will bow and every tongue will swear that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Herod uh, is making people cry. The Jews, he's making them cry. He doesn't realize he's led by Satan himself. He's led by the devil. 
See, the devil's in the story. That's why you got Christmas carols that mention the devil. I always do this quiz every year. What Christmas carols mention the devil? We just sung one. He's in it. Now, it's an even deeper prophecy that Herod is fulfilling unwittingly. It goes all the way back to the beginning and all the way to the end. Go to the book of Genesis chapter 3. You know, Genesis chapter 3 is the story of the fall of man. It's why we require a Christmas. We need a savior. We need someone. There's no one among us that can save us. We need someone to come from heaven down to earth and save us. Why? Because we're fallen. We fell. And Genesis 3 tells the story that, you know, that when we fell, when the first couple fell, we all fell in them. And what the God did immediately, being the judge of all the earth, they, they hid because they were afraid of God. Because once you, once you sin and fall, then you, you lose your, your courage, especially toward God. But he, the judge of all the earth came to the garden to set up an instant arraignment of the three perpetrators, the man, the woman, and the serpent, who is the devil. And he begins his indictment this way. See, shades of the end of the world. There's coming a judgment day. He begins his indictment like this to the man. Uh, have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? Notice he emphasizes command. Like you broke faith. You broke my law. Adam says, oh, the woman you gave me. She basically led me into it. So he refuses accountability when God questions him. By the way, why does God question him? Because God has every intention of saving him. All he wants to elicit is a humble confession of sin. But that was too much for Adam. He refused. So he went to the next perp, the woman. And he says, who told you you were naked? Well, God knows he answered every question. God doesn't need to ask us questions. He knows. Why does he ask us questions? Because he wants to elicit a humble confession of sin. He wants to save us. But the woman refused accountability too, blaming the serpent. When he came to the third perp, he didn't ask any questions. Why? Because he has no intention of saving the devil. How are you glad the Lord wants to save us? <laughs> he could have just written us off. He has no intention of saving the devil, so he doesn't ask him any question. But he does proclaim over him something. I've said this many times before. This must have seemed like a shaft of light penetrating the gloom of the guilty couple. Because he said in Genesis 3, 15, that there'd come an answer to what they'd done. Genesis 3, 15. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It's the first prophecy in the Bible. And what's God saying? They were sophisticated enough to get it. It took me a long time to get it, because I, my mind was darkened by my sin. But they got it right away, because the darkness was just descending on them. What's he saying? That the answer's going to come through a baby. <laughs> Another reason why I love this holiday. It's all about a baby. <laughs> I love babies. The answer comes through a baby. The seed of the woman. Now you and I know biology, and I guarantee you Adam and Eve knew it, that a woman doesn't have a seed. A woman just has the egg. The man gives the seed. So what do you mean the seed of the woman? A virgin-born Savior shall come to save you. And he shall crush the serpent's head. And they knew what all that implied. 
He will reverse the primal curse. He will restore us back into fellowship with God. He will give us a new start all over again. And in him shall come the forgiveness of sins and the reversal of all the effects of the fall and of the serpent and the primal curse. And But he will not do it without pain. The serpent shall bruise his heel. Now notice this, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Now that even that part of the prophecy has a double meaning. Number one, seed there is one person. The woman will have a baby without a man. A virgin shall have a child. One person. That one person will come and destroy the works of the devil. That one person will restore anyone willing back to God. That one person will come and suffer and die and purchase for us the forgiveness of sins. That's the real Christian message right there, the Christmas message. That one person, the seed of the woman, shall come. And when he gets here, then he will crush the serpent's head and break his power over humanity once and for all. And there is a seed of the serpent. Now, the devil can't have a baby. But there is someone coming that's the counterpoint to the seed of the woman, someone we call the Antichrist. He's going to come and try to deceive the whole world, and he's going to impose on the world the last spiritual test, the ultimate act of apostasy will be presented, the mark of the beast. But there's another sense in which this prophecy is Multi uh, multiple, uh, multiplied that there is what he's saying in this prophecy is the humanity is going to be separated into two different flows one the seed of the woman and two the seed of the serpent and what he's talking about is not physical birth there but affinity who are the serpent seed? Everyone who resists God like their father the devil, who will not submit to the call of God to repent and to be saved, who do not believe that they need to be saved, who claim their own righteousness and who defiantly resist every call of God on their life and who uh, who will, who believe that they could be their own salvation or man could be our salvation if they even think they need salvation and who actually believe the serpent's lie that we could all be as God. These are the seed of the serpent who will one day be headed up by Antichrist and whose end will be the lake of fire. Now who's the seed of the woman? All of that part of humanity who realize what they did and who repent of their sins. You see, you'd have to understand what happened next in the story to understand this prophecy. The next thing that happens after this indictment and this promise of gospel is that God told the man and the woman to strip themselves of their fig leaf clothes. Why? Fig leaf clothes. The man and woman were ashamed because of sin, but they made their own set of clothes. And they tried to cover their shame with their clothes. That's what false religion is. They're trying to deal with the sense of sin, but not with blood. So the man and woman meekly submitted, and then they allowed, to their horror, they saw God kill. The first physical death was a beast, probably a lamb. And they sit there and watch in horror at the results of what they did. But God made them clothes out of that lamb to put on to truly cover their shame. See, what's the lesson there? That's the gospel. That you can't do away with your sin. You can't solve your own mental complexes that your sin has brought into your life, your guilt, paranoia, or whatever, but that something has been done for you which costs someone innocent their own blood. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, to him who loved us 
and washed us from our sins in his own blood. To him be glory, majesty, dominion, honor, and power, both now and forever, and all God's people said. Amen. See, the seed of the woman is everybody that in continuity with Adam and Eve just humbly divest themselves of their own self-righteousness and allows Jesus and his sacrifice to clothe them and to make them presentable to God. So humanity will be divided into two. Now, back to the first part of it, though, it says there'll be one person, the seed of the woman. And see, as soon as the devil knew that, then he went to work to try to take it out. Now, this is the meaning of so many stories in the Bible. Like Abraham gets his wife taken by Pharaoh. Why? Because the devil was attacking the seed. Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't a miracle birth. It was Pharaoh. That's Pharaoh's child. Oh, God wouldn't let Pharaoh touch her. But that was an attack on the seed by the devil. That's how you understand so much of the Old Testament. Isaac had the same thing happen. We just read the story in 2 Kings of Queen Athaliah. Jezebel's daughter actually became queen of Judea and tried to wipe out all of the royal children because God said to David, it'll be one of your children. That, that's who the seed of the woman will be, one of your children. And so she killed every one of her grandchildren except one. A priest hid him away in the temple. That happened to be the ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. They, the, the seed's been preserved. You got Pharaoh trying to kill all the babies in, in Egypt that were Jewish. Why? What is behind this? This is the devil. This is Satan himself, the one that heard the original primal promise, who wants to stamp it out before it's over. And that was the devil operating through Herod. Now, I want you to look in the book of Revelation. See, we went from Genesis, now go to Revelation 12. And then you could go home and say, man, what a long preacher. He preached from Genesis to Revelation. But in Revelation 12, he, John sees a vision in the skies. Verse 1, there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. See, Matthew tells you what actually happened in history. John tells you the vision in the spirit of what was happening. The woman, see, Revelation 12 is the counterpart to Genesis 3. Think about it. What do you got in Genesis 3? You got a serpent in a garden, a woman, and a man, but he's not too effectual. Okay. But by Revelation 12, the woman's clothed and pregnant and in labor. The serpent has become a dragon. And he cannot wait for her to have that child because he's right there to destroy it. He wants to eat it. Someone says, man, when's that going to happen? Well, this isn't telling you something that's going to happen. This is a revelation of something that is happening and always has happened from the beginning. The devil wants to destroy the seed. The devil wants to devour the child before he comes to manhood. The devil wants to wipe out the seed of the woman. And of course, obviously, you know and I know he failed. But he now wants to wipe out the woman and the other seed of the woman. 
Christians and Jews. Why? Well, we'll talk about that for a minute. Why, he, what's he think he's doing? Well, if he can outsmart God. The woman that appears in heaven is pregnant. And she's in pain, laboring to bring forth. Now, without going into too much detail, because I told you I wouldn't keep you too long, the identity of the woman is very important. This is the counterpart to Genesis 3. We know who that woman was. That was Eve. Now, when I used to go to St. Ludmilla's Catholic Church here in town, right in the front of the altar, they had a great big statue of the Virgin, and she stood on the earth, and we marveled, because if you looked under her shoes, you could see the, the serpent's head. And I used to think, yes, Mary will destroy Satan in the end. I thought that. I actually thought that. She had 12 stars, and she stood on the earth, and the moon was behind her. And I thought, that's exactly what's going to happen. But then I found out that that was a blasphemous misrepresentation of the original promise. It's not the woman that crushes the serpent. It's the seed of the woman. They've replaced Jesus with Mary. Very serious problem. Okay, you used to pray to Mary. I prayed, part of it was the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with you. We'd say that all the time. I could say that backwards and forwards. I could say 10 of them. That was part of the rosary. And I could say it without even thinking about it. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Up till then, all I'm doing is quoting scripture. But then I go, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Now and at the hour of our death. Now look, if you're going to die and you're putting all your weight on Mary, you're going to go to hell because Mary cannot save. She was used greatly, but she can't save you. Jesus is the one that died for you. Now, anyway, who is this woman then? Well, the Bible is interpreted by the Bible. That's the best rule of interpretation. And if you study Genesis, you see the story of Joseph. And Joseph has a couple of dreams. One of them is that the brothers and him were going to go out and reap in the field the wheat. And he said, brothers, you cannot believe the edifying dream I had last night. And they go, really? What is it? Well, I dreamt that we were all sheaves of wheat. Twelve of us. Twelve. And you, 11 sheaves, bowed down to me, the 12th sheaf. <laughs> Man, did they hate him for that. But look, I want to emphasize, they hated him because that was the word of God. They hated the word of God. Next night, he has an even more explicit dream. He says, brothers, brothers, I got to share the dream. I saw 12 stars and the sun and the moon. And 11 of the stars and the sun and the moon all bowed down to my star. And man, even his father got mad at him. You're going to have your mother and father bow down to you? <laughs> and they hated him for that. But that was the word of God. Now, but also what that does is that gives us the interpretation. Who is this woman he saw in heaven, pregnant with child, and the serpent hates her and wants to devour the child? Well, that woman is Israel. <laughs> we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, ransom captive Israel. That woman is Israel. In what sense has she been pregnant? Well, Genesis 3 does go on to say, nothing because of the fall, nothing valuable comes into this world without pain or suffering. Even birth, you go right down to the edge of death. Man, we had four home births. Am I ever glad that part of my life's over? Praise the Lord. 
But it was awesome, but I mean, wow. What's Israel been in labor with? Why do people hate her? Why is she persecuted for 2,000 years? Well, for one thing, you can love her or hate her, but this Bible that you have in your lap, you wouldn't have it if they hadn't been faithful. God used them to give us the word of God. For another, there's one time on earth where the only true worship on earth was there, was there at their temple. The only witness to God was them. Uh, the whole rest of the world was pagan. And then the most important thing that they, she's pregnant with is uh, the Messiah. Jesus came through her. Now, let me just close by saying, let's wrap this up. The devil is the great red dragon, the serpent of old. If you got a woman and a serpent and a man in Genesis, you got a woman pregnant and a dragon in Revelation. And the dragon wants to take the child before he could do what he's set to do. Of course, you'd want to wipe out your rivals. Herod did not realize he was being led by the devil. I don't think the world leaders today realize that they're being led by the devil. That Satan is, someone says, the devil's been after me all week long. I doubt it. He's up there with, the, you know, Trump and uh, Macron and all the top people in the world. He probably just assigned a low level imp to you, all right? The devil is trying to thwart the plan of God. The devil wants to wipe out. Well, if he can't wipe out the man-child, which he couldn't, Joseph was warned in a dream, you go hide. Where's the, where's the least likely place to go hide? Egypt. That's where Israel came out of. You wouldn't think it, God had sent anyone back, but he did. Go hide in Egypt until this is over. God saved the seed of the woman so that he could come to manhood, so that he could present his life as a sacrifice. This is the real Christmas message. He escaped death. He escaped the devil so that he could come and save us. Now what's the serpent doing now then? He hasn't given up. He'd love to wipe out the woman. Now what you're gonna see is Israel alienated, hated, despised. There'll be a, a serious attempt to wipe her out before this is over. I'm kidding you not, the Holocaust is just one, one installment on it. By the way, one third of all, it, of all world Jewry was killed in the Holocaust. They estimate there was 18 million Jews before the Holocaust. It's only, it took out six million. Okay. Um, this is the dragon that Herod represents. This is the serpent. He's got seven heads and 10 horns. And without going into detail, let me just put it this way. All political power, all worldly influence and power, all wealth is put to the service of the dragon. Did you just read the other day? Christianity Today is basically controlled by George Soros. <laughs> Are you kidding me? A magazine started by Billy Graham. Controlled by George Soros. See, Herod still lives, the dragon still lives. You still got people trying to kill babies. You still got people trying to wipe out Israel. And you know what though, thank you Jesus. We still have a savior. He, he survived, he lived, he came to manhood. He died on the tree and by his death, he crushed the serpent's head. He's coming again. The Lord shall destroy the serpent finally with the breath of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. Come quickly, Jesus, come quickly. The second coming is like the first. How many were aware? How many were awake? A few shepherds here, a few old people that everyone ignored in the temple, some wise people from the east that they were all scared of. Who may abide the day of his coming? Who will stand when he appears? His coming again to judge the world in righteousness. Oh, Father, we praise you. Come, let us adore him. Come, let us adore him. Come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Merry Christmas. No, sir.